right. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ellen Blix. Ellen Blix is a prof professor of midwifery science at Oslo and Akerhus uh, University College in Oslo, Norway. She was educated as a midwife in 1986. She attained a, an MPH in the year 2000 and a Dr. PH in uh, 2006. Ellen Blix has worked as a clinical midwife for 20 years, most of the time in a small local hospital in northern Norway. She's also worked in bigger university clinics as a community midwife and in projects in Lebanon, the West Bank, and Cambodia. Her research areas are place of birth, duration of labor, fetal surveillance, and normal births. Ellen, turn on your microphone and away you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Is my microphone on now, Lorraine? Yes, it is, and you, and you sound and good. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference, and congratulations with the International uh, uh, Midwifery Day. And I want to invite you to Norway during this uh, talk. And we have just been to Romania. And thank you to Elisa and Irina for a very interesting and almost heartbreaking presentation from Romania. And this is another story in, in Norway. And. Uh, In case you didn't know, Norway is in uh, northern Europe. It is stretching from uh, very far uh, towards the north. And uh, we are a part of the Nordic countries, together with Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and Finland. And we are all rich countries, and Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. We have uh, good health systems, and we have health registries, and we have very good birth registries. And Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and also Iceland, we have a common history, a common culture, we are the same ethnic group, and we have almost the same language. In Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, we can understand each other when we talk. Norway is a very big country with few inhabitants. We are a little more than 5 million people in an area of more than 304,000 square kilometers. And that is 10 times the size of Belgium. We have a few cities and we have huge rural areas. Here on the photo you can see all those big blocks there. That's the barcode area in Oslo. It's the, it's the newest and most modern uh, part of Oslo. And down there you can see a part of the Lofoten Islands in northern Norway. Uh, we, are, uh, we have less uh, unemployment than other countries in the area and other countries than Europe. And our, uh, we, are, we are rich also because we found a lot of oil uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And, uh, most women, also those with, with the children, are part of the work stuff. They are working outside their homes. The breastfeeding rates are among the highest in the Western world. And we have paid parental leave. And mothers and fathers can stay at home until their child is one year, and they will have some money for it. Most inhabitants are ethnic Norwegians. But we have one indigenous group, and you can see a photo of a mother and her baby and the grandmother up there in the, in the left corner. And uh, it is about 40,000 Sami people, and they are living in the northern part of Norway and in uh, Sweden, Finland, and Russia as well. And uh, they are declining because of the influence of the majority, and only a third of those who say they are Sami people, they, they can speak their Sami language but it's still a living language. We have a growing immigration population, and 15% of all, uh, all inhabitants in Norway are first or second generation immigrants. But they are unequally distributed along uh, uh, in the country, because in the Oslo, the capital area has more than 30% immigrants, while other areas have very few. But most of the immigrants come from Poland, from Somalia, Sweden, Lithuania, Iraq, Pakistan, and of course, we have uh, refugees though from Syria and uh, from Afghanistan and also other countries. 
All health care during pregnancy and childbirth is free of charge. And, and also uh, illegal immigrants are granted emergency health care. And pregnant uh, women who are, for instance, asylum seekers who have not uh, got the permission to stay in Norway, but who still stay illegally, they are granted maternity care without risking to be arrested uh, and deported. We probably all agree that there is a need in, in, in uh, almost all countries for a new model for maternity system that focuses on optimizing biological, psychological, social and cultural processes and strengthening women's cap uh, capabilities. And I think that most of you are familiar with this model or framework from the Lancet series on midwifery from 2014. Now I will tell you about midwifery and maternity care in Norway, but we should have this model in mind. And in the end of the, of the talk, we can see what is working well and where there might be need for improvement or change. And about the, we could also think about the, if our practice is in line with evidence-based recommendations. We have strong evidence for recommend, uh, recommending continuity of care. We have strong evidence for recommending uh, in, uh, intermittent auscultation in low-risk uh, birth. And we have uh, strong evidence for one-to-one -one care during the active phase of labor. We are about uh, 3,000 registered midwives in Norway. And we work, as in most countries, in antenatal, intrapartum and postpartum care, most of us. I know a little about midwifery education. Almost 200 years ago, we had the first midwifery school in Norway. And that is the school where I am working now. So we have educated midwives for, uh, for uh, almost 200 years. And we will have a big celebration in 2018. As in many other European cities, there, there uh, was a public maternal hospital where poor women and uh, unmarried women could be cared of for free, and midwives and medical students could be trained. And 200 years ago, to, become, to be trained as a midwife, you should not be younger than 20 years old and not more than 30 years old. And married women with own children were preferred with experience from childbirth. And uh, they were supposed to be good women, so they had to, they had to go to the priest in uh, the town or the place they came from, and he should recommend them. And it, it was not necessary that they could read in that time, but it was an advantage. But to become a midwife today, you have to be a qualified nurse first and have a bachelor in nursing, and with minimum one year work experience as a nurse. So we don't, do not have direct entry uh, midwifery schools in Norway. We have five schools, and uh, two of them offer midwifery education at the master's level. And that is the, the one in Oslo and in Tunsberg, number four and five. The others are working towards master's programs. And it takes two years in the midwifery school to become a midwife. And, and a, a total of one year is clinical practice, and the rest is theory. As in uh, other countries, the role of the midwife is supposed to be that she is an autonomous practitioner in pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal care. And we also have a role in women's sexual and reproductive health, even if midwives, uh, even if few midwives are working within these uh, areas. But you can uh, you can uh, be a counselor in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, anti in anticonception and uh, give advice to women with problems in their menopause also. And the organization of maternity care in Norway is that antenatal care in, is both in primary and secondary care. Birth care is almost only in, uh, in uh, secondary care, apart from a, a few home births that are taken care of by independent midwives. And uh, postnatal care is also in primary and secondary care. And now, I, in this lecture, I will just uh, talk a little about antenatal and postnatal care and concentrate on intrapartum care. And, women, and in antenatal care, women are cared for by midwives and, uh, and GPs. 
and we have national guidelines uh, from the from the health authority and they are very good they are evidence based they are a bit old they are from 2005 but they are under revision now and according to these guidelines the women the women should be able to choose between a midwife or a gp or she can go to both a mixture to uh, that they share the the antenatal care but uh, many places there are too few midwives employed to offer midwifery care to all women and there are also some uh, professional uh, ten tensions or conflicts and um, who is going to be the lead uh, carer in uh, in antenatal care and uh, for the time being it is uh, more or less the gps and healthy women will have a routine ultrasound screening at the hospital but the rest of the checkups and uh, will be in the primary care And uh, midwifery practice in, in antenatal care is like many other countries, as you can see here on the list. And what is special in Norway is probably that we have uh, we have uh, midwives working with preventing tick leave in pregnant women. I don't know if that's so common in other countries. And that is that big organisations or municipalities they go to they uh, they will employ a midwife. And she will go around to ensure that the pregnant women working there uh, have a good work conditions so that they, they don't go early on the sick leave. And that can be things that they can have a good chair to sit in or the possibility to uh, have a five minute rest every hour and put the legs up. Or maybe she should do something else that, uh, than her usual tasks. And this has been a success. A lot of uh, it has uh, uh, the, the rates of uh, of sick leave in pregnancy has uh, declined very much since this was introduced. It's not everywhere, but it is many places. And then postnatal care. That women are usually offered a very short stay in hospital, and some hospitals offer uh, postnatal care at a pa in a patient hotel, where the woman can have a, a room and where she can stay with her husband or partner and. Uh, and see who she wants, and she can uh, have help if she and advice if she needs that. And we have, uh, and the rest of the care should be in the in primary care. And some years ago, we had a health reform indicating that women and also other patients should stay as short as possible in the hospital, and then the follow up and uh, should should be done in primary care. But uh, when it comes to maternity care, we, uh, the women are, uh, are uh, discharged from the hospital early, but the municipalities who should take uh, the primary care have not been staffed up to take care of the women in their home. But it will hopefully improve. And also we have uh, national guidelines for postnatal care. They are very good and they are evidence-based. And very good promoting uh, women's own abilities and promoting breastfeeding. What is probably special also about Norway is the, our high breastfeeding uh, rate. And we have a long tradition of that. And we also have a national advice, advisory unit on breastfeeding. And this is uh, fin uh, financed by the health authority. And, and uh, their tasks are to increase knowledge and uh, establish and monitor best practice standards and that is the baby friendly hospital and baby friendly neonatal units and baby friendly uh, health stations and so on and to do research and they give advice to health authorities and health care providers not to not to uh, mothers and they are staffed also by mid by midwives and others with special education on uh, breastfeeding We do not have any representative users organizations for maternity care, and that's a pity, and I hope it will come. But we do have a strong users organization for promoting and supporting breastfeeding. And they consist of mothers with experience of breastfeeding and special training in counseling. And mothers who have the problems or uh, questions can, uh, can call or send an email, and they will get help. And they also work politically. And then I will talk more about 
about uh, intrapartum care. But first, I would like to say that Norway and also the other Nordic countries are good and safe places to give birth and to be born compared to other places in the world. We just heard how it was in Romania, for instance. We have access to free health care during pregnancy and childbirth, and there are well organized and free of charge health care and vaccination programs for all, ch for all children. Mothers and also fathers can have uh, leave to take care of the new child. And, uh, and we have access to clean water, to safe and good housing. Everybody can have an education. And there are rights for women, there are rights for employees and for children. There is, for instance, it's uh, forbidden to, to, uh, to beat and hit children in Norway. And in general, we get decent paid for our work. And when we get old, we can retire and we can we still have money to live for. But everything is, of course, not perfect. For example, there is a small but increasing group of poor people here in Norway, as well as in other countries, falling outside the society, and this causes unhealth. Also, when it comes to maternal and neonatal outcomes. And maternal death is death in a woman during pregnancy and within 42 days after birth or abortion. And the maternal mortality rate in Norway is 7 per 100,000 live births. And we just heard that it was 31 in Romania, so that is much higher. And this is about four women every year in Norway. And most midwives are so lucky that we have never experienced that a mother died. And the rate is varying widely across the world from the lowest is in Singapore with three, and the highest in Chad with 1,100 uh, per 100,000 live births. If we in Norway had the same rate as Chad, almost 700 mothers would have died every year. And that is two mothers every day. And perinatal deaths and stillborns are, perinatal deaths are stillborns and deaths in the first seven days of life. And it is 3.5 in Norway, and that's among the lowest in the world. And this has been stable for about the, the, the last 10 years. And this means, in crude numbers, it means that two, we have about 230 uh, perinatal deaths every year. The global perinatal mortality rate is 20 per thousand uh, births, and it's 47 where it, where it is highest. So while medicalization of normal births is a serious problem in Western countries, the problem in poor countries is lack of access to medical care and, of course, poverty because poor people are carrying the heaviest burden here. I am so lucky that I have grandchildren, and when my daughters-in-law and my daughter were in labor, I was not worried about their lives or the lives of the babies. I was worrying about if they got good support from their midwives to manage labor pain, about unnecessary interventions, and I was very worried about early clamping of the cord and matters like that. If I had been living in Chad, for instance, I would have been worried about the life of my daughter or daughter-in-law and about the child. When it comes to intrapartum care, it is mainly in hospitals. But there is a midwife attending absolutely all births. Also, if there is an elective cesarean section, a midwife will take care of the woman before the cesarean. She will take her down to the operation theater and take care of the baby afterwards and, uh, and make sure that the, that the woman can, can have the baby as soon as possible. And remember I told you about the guidelines uh, for postnatal and antenatal care. We also have guidelines uh, for intrapartum care, but they are not made by the health authorities. They are made by the Association of Gynecologists and Obstetricians. And they have taken some midwives with them while uh, making these uh, this, uh, guidelines, but not users, and uh, the quality could have been better. So I hope that the health authorities also will make guidelines in the future. And Norway also has a principle of differentiated uh, maternity care. And that is a parliament resolution from 2001 and again in 2009. The aim is to offer women individual and appropriate care and to avoid medical intervention having little proven benefit in low-risk labors. And we have 46 birth institutions and almost uh, 60,000 births every year. And maternity care is 
organized at uh, three levels. I will talk about that a little later. This map shows birthing institutions in Norway. There are uh, 40 of them are in hospitals and six are freestanding midwifery units. The, the freestanding midwifery units, they are organized under uh, a hospital, so, so they are in uh, secondary care. And there are also four alongside midwifery units in hospitals. The number of, uh, of birthing institutions has declined over time. It is, uh, in 1980, it was almost 100 institutions, and now it is 46. And now about uh, the three levels of uh, care. The, uh, it is specialized units in bigger hospitals and it is units in smaller hospitals, and then it is midwifery-led units, and we also have home births. And level one, it is the uh, specialized units in bigger hospitals, and they usually have uh, more than uh, 1,500 births annually. And there are midwives, obstetricians, pediatricians, and anesthesiologists available all the time, and they have a neonatal intensive care unit close to the delivery unit. And there are also some other rules about what equipment and that they should do research and so on. And the next level is uh, level two, that is delivery units in smaller hospitals. And they usually have between 1,500 and 400 births annually. And there will always be a midwife present and the obstetricians and anesthesiologists will be on call. And some of these hospitals also have a pediatric service, but not uh, an intensive unit. And there are selection criteria. Women with, with some special uh, conditions will be uh, referred to a level one hospital. And within our hospitals, within uh, level one and two hospitals, we have differentiated care within uh, the unit. And that means that at admission, when the woman comes to the to the unit in labor, the the attending midwife will make a selection, and she will see, she will decide if the woman is low risk or if she has a higher risk for complications. And low risk women are often called green green uh, green group women, and uh, those with risk for complications are called red women. And then they are allocated to green or red care care, but they they will be in the same unit. And uh, obstetricians will not be involved in uh, the low-risk women, the green women. And uh, uh, low-risk women should, for example, n uh, not have a CTG going on. That, that would be intermittent auscultation. And then uh, the selection process will, of course, go on through, uh, through all the birth. So the woman will be uh, allocated to, uh, to gr a red group if, uh, if there will be some... Uh, complications, or if she has an epidural also. And we have a few uh, alongside midwifery units in Norway, and they are all in bigger university hospitals. And we have had, uh, we used to have two more, but both of them have closed in spite of good results. And they closed for political reasons and, uh, and uh, economical reasons. And about 7 to 8 percent of all births in Norway uh, are in alongside units. And water births are quite common uh, in these units, and also in some hospital units. And uh, two of this, of this uh, hospital to have uh, alongside the uh, unit, they, uh, they have decided that all low-risk women should start labor in, uh, in, uh, in the alongside unit. And the idea behind this is that it may will promote more normal births. And we have a few uh, freestanding midwifery units, and most five of them. We have six units, and five of them are in northern Norway. And in the northern part of Norway, almost 10% of all births are in freestanding units. Uh, unit. And uh, as I told you, Norway is a very, a very big con country, and Northern Norway is almost half of the country, but there is only 10% per of the population are living there. 
So it is the between uh, between the four and five thousand birth in northern Norway, but they have six, uh, five uh, freestanding midwifery units and uh, and uh, five hospitals there. So there are a lot of institutions, but few births. And these uh, freestanding units, they are usually connected to a health center or a small local hospital without obstetric unit units. And there are about six hundred births on these six units uh, annually, altogether. And there are usually long distances to the nearest uh, obstetric unit from 16 to 28 kilometers. And sometimes that involves a ferry or a mountain uh, passage also. And the Norwegian health, health authorities do not organize home births. And the woman herself must find a midwife willing to assist the birth. But the health authorities will pay the midwife for assisting the birth, but not for being on call or for transport to the woman's home. And home births are most common in, in and around the biggest cities, and not very common in rural areas. And we have uh, national guidelines for, uh, for planned home births, and they are quite good, and they are... Uh, uh, and I, I will say that they are evidence-based. I was in the group making these guidelines. But it's quite a pity that so few women are choosing to birth at home. But it is, there are few, uh, few midwives that are willing to attend home birth. And it is, uh, so it's not common, and many women have uh, never heard about home births. So if we look, as I told you, we have a decentralized uh, system in Norway, we, and we have many small institutions. But if we look at the total uh, births, we can see that half of all births they were happening in five hospitals, five bigger hospitals. And 28% of all births were in, in eight uh, medium big, big hospitals. So uh, three quarters of all births are in 13 hospitals altogether. And then 17% of all births were in 11 institutions from, with, uh, with a size from 500 to, to 1,500 births. And, uh, and a small proportion in 22 institutions small institutions. So we have small hospitals also. And we have a few planned home births. We have more unplanned home births than planned home births, actually. And we also, of course, have some births happening under, during transport to the hospital. Our cesarean section rate is about 17%. And we have 10% uh, operative vaginal deliveries. But to uh, cesarean section rate varies between institutions from uh, 13 to uh, 26 percent, so there are variations. And here is just showing variation, but this is not between institutions, this is between regions. So it's uh, quite, uh, it's big differences. There is, on the western part of Norway, where you see this yellow line, they have uh, only almost 14 percent cesarean. And there are uh, hospitals who have even a little less than that. And other interventions in labor, we have an increasing uh, rate of induction of labor, and it is 18% no. We have 16% episiotomies, and oxytocin augmentations, they are at least 35%, probably more. And the one third of all women have an um, epidural analgesia, uh, analgesia during labor. And these are interventions when, uh, not, in, not, uh, not induction of labor, but episiotomies and oxytocin and uh, also epidural analgesia, the, the midwife can influence uh, much on that. And, uh, all, uh, and uh, episiotomies are usually cut by the midwife, and we can see there are great variations in episiotomy rates also across the country between different regions, and they are varying. And this is the variation in oxytocin augmentation rate. That is also varying quite a lot across the country. And we have this differentiated uh, birth care. But what are the effects of the differentiated birth care in Norway? And what is evaluated in uh, the different uh, uh, sort, uh, kind of unit? And as I said, Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. And then I think also we have a responsibility to do research, to spend some of the money on research on our healthcare system. So 
So I have tried to find out what is done in uh, evaluating this uh, different kind of units. And studies, uh, and these are studies uh, on uh, midwifery led alongside units in Norway. And uh, we have only three studies about that. And uh, and uh, these three, they are all made by uh, led by midwives. These studies. And uh, the first one, Lucaste, that is an observational study describing the transfers and outcomes of women who plan to give birth in, uh, in uh, the ABC unit, in, alongside military units in Oslo. And the next one is, uh, is a cohort study comparing healthy primiparous women who started labor in an alongside unit with a comparable group who gave birth in the conventional obstetric unit in the same clinic. And the third one is a randomized control trial uh, where women were randomized to three different units and the outcomes were compared. And we have found, uh, and these studies report the same what we see from, uh, from other countries, that there are less interventions in labor in women who start uh, care in, uh, in midwifery-led units. But we could not, none of, uh, neither Ada or Bernitz could report uh, significant differences in